Okay, welcome everyone to the 13th webinar in the series. Uh, this one, Ask the Coach. Um, I guess more specifically, it's or more precisely, it's Ask the Coaches, since Rick and I are both here. Uh, please leave yourselves muted throughout. Um, so how are you going to ask the coach? You're going to send questions to Erica in the chat. And that's, uh, that's how we'll work it. So um, we'll just go ahead and go right into it. Erica, what's, uh, what do you got first? Okay, um, just one quick note before then. There, so there are two Craftsbury Outdoor Centers that you're, you'll see when you go to select who you're sending a chat to. I'm the one that says host. So you should send it to me and then I'll be able to read it to Rick and to Troy. Um, so Craftsbury Outdoor Center host, and I'll send that in the chat in just a second. But the first question, um, we got a whole bunch via email. So we'll go through most of those, but anybody who has questions that come up during the talk, they can also submit. Um, but this first question came from John Livingstone, and he asked if Rick and Troy could share insights of how they've coached athletes to enhance their self-awareness of the body in motion and their curiosity without judgment. Um, if they have any, if you guys have any body or mental routines that you suggest. So Troy, you want me to go first? Am I, am I on now? Uh, absolutely. Age before okay. beauty. Okay. Well, first of all, thanks for coming. Thank you, Troy. Thank you, Erica. Um, I thought this was an interesting uh, format because um, I couldn't see all the questions. And so it was really sort of, I don't want to say ad lib, but it was certainly going to be something that you had to be very um, light on your feet to be able to come up with something that an explanation that makes sense. And to answer John's question first, um, if I read it correctly or understand it correctly, the idea of being able to assimilate what's actually going to be happening on the water and the, to the extent that someone can do that. Um, frequently, um, and this is not new, but I would say the first thing that helps in sculling in, in to, to, to allude to what John said is the idea of creating what would be um, loosely called a meditative state. And so the preparation that you would, for, you would have in, as you approach the boathouse. I actually encourage my athletes to start visualizing the, um, the, the, the session on the water before, well, when they first get up to go to practice in the morning. But to start the visualization process um, and start to review in your mind what you did before or the practice before as you get to the boathouse. And I do think, and Jimmy Joy was great with this, of having some sort of meditative um, state or meditative process doesn't have to be very long that gets you in the position to be more receptive to what the shell and the oars in the water uh, can tell you. So to get to John's question, uh, the first step was to get into that med meditative mindset. Um, and so if you have a coach, uh, part of the responsibility of the coach is to set that tone. And um, I'm sure that there's different ways to do that. It's not as easy as it may sound, but setting the tone. So let's assume that you're sculling by yourself and you have to set your own tone. Uh, one, of the, one aspect of this, which I was doing this summer, which really helped, is I set aside enough time so that it didn't have to hurry. I think if you get to the boathouse and you're in a hurry to either get on the water, get off the water and go to work, I think it's gonna be tough. So what you need to do is set up a schedule whereby you know how much time you have and then do not hurry because hurrying through the practice or being in, uh, anxious about the outcome uh, is pretty much a sure way of not getting better. Um, and so the meditative state uh, based on your approach to um, your overall outing. Uh, the next thing that I do is um, I do a series of short warm-ups on the dock, just little stretching activities um, that I've practiced in the past, um, uh, basically swinging my arms around, doing a lot of upper body stretching. The reason I do that is because I think your upper body has to be very fluid. And then I have a routine when I get into the shell, and Troy has seen this, where I push off the dock and this is a routine that uh, Steve Fairbairn alludes to in his books about tipping, tipping the boat port and starboard and getting a really good tipping effect. That really helps uh, to relax you. And also what it does is it gets you used to the instability, which is certainly not the case when you're walking on the, on the dock or on the ground. So getting into that first. Um, and I do that. I also do something that Troy uses when he uh, does his comfort in the boat of letting go of one oar handle. And then letting go of the other one, I think that really helps. And what that's facilitating is keeping a really loose um, 
position of your fingers and your hands on the oar handles. That has an immense impact. Those are the two things. And then eventually uh, doing some twisting to make sure I can see where I'm going and to, to survey the course. Another aspect of sculling, which can create a lot of anxiety, which impedes your ability to sense the movement is of being afraid of running into something. So looking around and getting a really good perspective on where you're going and what else is out there is really important. Uh, even if you've been on a body of water before, just checking out, seeing if there's any different motorboats moored or the sailboats or whatever is out there. Clearly it's easier on a still body of water. Maybe the Charles River would be more difficult. Uh, and then after that, start sculling. And what I like to do is start to scull with the blades on the water. Again, staying as relaxed as possible. So I'm gonna stop at that point and let Troy take it from here and, and add to what I just said, Troy, go ahead. Um, okay, I mean, I, I, uh, I agree with most everything you've already said. I, I do wanna address the, the verbiage of meditative state. I know that uh, there, there are a lot of people who hear that and say, oh, cool, I, I, I love meditative states, so I, I, wanna, I wanna do that. And I think there's, a, there's an equally large cohort of people that hear the term meditative state and, and think some quasi-religious, this is, this is gonna be some sort of woo-woo thing and and it, it it turns off their it turns off their willingness to to entertain it further. Uh, so you know if, if you get hung up on the on the phrase meditative state, uh, I think that what we're really talking about, whether whether you call it meditation or not, is the recognition that in order to perform optimally or even just to perform well in any sport, the athlete has to be in a very specific neurological place. Um, and I, I talked a little bit about this in my first webinar on, uh, on comfort in the boat and, and getting more comfortable in your single. But, um, you know, reproducing that state, whatever your routine is, uh, and I, I like Rick's, um, it is in fact meditative, both to, to do it and to watch it. You know, get, get in the boat and, and do some simple things and give yourself enough time to start your outings patiently. Uh, but I think that a, a lot of it has to do with just a, a, a willingness to, to make a conscious focused effort to reproduce the neurological state that you need to be in in order to perform well. And one of the, one of the tricks that that I use and encourage athletes to use is just to remember a time when you rode well, preferably in circumstances similar to the ones that you are facing with whatever outing you're starting. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're at a regatta and it's a, it's a sprint race, um, remember a time when you were at a regatta at a sprint race and you performed well and spend just a few minutes trying to remember what that felt like and what your mood was like that day and, and what the rhythm of, of your first strokes and, and the strokes that you took during the race were. And, and you can begin, you give yourself a better chance of reproducing it if you have given it some focused attention before you ever uh, start moving the boat. Um, there was another aspect of, of John's question that, uh, that immediately caught my attention. Uh, John, you used the the phrase body awareness en enhancement. And um, I think that in any sport, you're asked and you, you need to pay attention to different parts of your body than, than, than your daily routine in other arenas uh, requires you to pay attention to. When you're sculling, I think it's very helpful to pay attention to your sit bones and to feel the boat under your sit bones as, as an equestrian would feel, would feel the horse under her. Um, most people aren't used to paying a lot of attention to their sit bones. Um, and it becomes a question of uh, focused practice at shifting your attention to different parts of the body that, that help you skull better. Um, Rick likes to talk about uh, coaching the feet, and we'll, I think we, there's a question uh, that's already been submitted about coaching the feet, and uh, I, I, I make fun of Rick endlessly on his, his gambit that what, what we need is translucent boats. You need a translucent boat so you can see the athlete's feet. You got to coach the feet. You got to be able to coach the feet. He's not wrong. 
Um, the feet are important. Most people don't pay a lot of attention to their feet in their daily lives. Uh, most people don't pay a lot of attention to their sit, sits bones in their daily lives. They don't pay a lot of attention to their sternums in their daily lives. So part of the process of sculling better is getting better and getting more habitual about shifting your attention to those parts of your body that help you skull better. Um, that I, I, I may be, uh, I'll, I'll keep everybody in the, in the short story I'm about to tell anonymous um, for, and you'll, you'll understand why after I tell the story, but uh, we, we were, there, there was a, there was a beginning sculler uh, at Craftsbury a few years ago and she was obviously overthinking things pretty pretty seriously and wasn't uh, wasn't making a lot of progress because she would she had too many things on her mind and and had you know, her her attention was was somewhat scattered and uh, the 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 other coach that was in the launch with me uh, said you know I'm I'm not I'm not sure she's aware that she has a body and you know it wasn't it wasn't the the sort of thing that that you'd want to uh, to repeat in public in, in such a way that the sculler would hear it. But what, what the coach was really saying was, she's in her head right now and she's not paying attention to what her handles are doing. She's not paying attention to her sit bones. Um, she's, she's just stuck. She's stuck between her ears. Um, and being able to shift your attention. We, we live in our heads and we, we live in our hands because you know our, our heads that's that's where we think the locus of thinking is rightly or wrongly and we do a lot of things with our hands and so we're very aware of head and hands but sculling requires you to be aware of a lot more of of your of yourself than that and learning to shift the focus the athlete's focus your own focus to different parts of you that uh that you don't habitually pay attention to in your daily life that's that's a big part of learning to skull so I think that's uh, I'd like to add to that, Troy. One of the things I'll tell people is think off the water, feel on the water. Think off the water. This gets into Fairbairn's famous idea about talking of talking shop. So think about sculling off the water. You can do that a lot. You can do it while you're sitting at a stoplight waiting for this light to change. Visualize, think about it, read about it. When you get on the water, feel it. And the thought process that you go through when you're on the off the water will color and give you an opportunity to to interpret your experience on the water but sculling on the water is about feel and all the conceptual frameworks and, and, di and directives that you get from all kinds of places including the coaches um, will be in your head they're already there uh, your visual sense of what the sport looks like all those things are very powerful to create a three-dimensional awareness of the sport that stuff is going to be there you don't need to think on the water feel on the water think off the water and I say that, and hopefully that makes a little bit of sense to um, everyone here. And then the last part that John um, and I have talked about previous to this question is being non-judgmental. Um, Self-admonishment when you're sculling is just the kiss of death. You got to go out there and just, if anything, when you're sculling, if something doesn't seem to be what you might want it to be, being curious about it, but not being judgmental is immensely important for you to eventually develop a oneness with um, with the shell, the skulls, and the water. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to spend too much time on on the first question. We do need to move on. But I, you, what you just said, Rick, reminds me that uh, very very common experience, especially on the first couple of days of sculling camp, is to be to be watching a sculler and see the sculler make a mistake, and and just get this just this head shake of of utter disgust and 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 sort of self-recrimination and it it you, you need to set that aside it doesn't do you a bit of good um you know you made a mistake everybody makes mistakes everybody takes bad strokes just keep keep sculling keep going okay awesome thank you both of you um several questions that kind of dovetail nicely with what you guys have been talking about. So we'll start off with one from Ab Abigail Lixfeld about the butt. So she says, we don't hear a lot about butt slash hip slash pelvic position, but it's one of the key places we're connected to the boat. And I spend a lot of time adjusting myself on the seat. So 
How should the hips and pelvis be moving through the different phases of the rowing stroke and how might improper hip movement slash flexibility slash position affect the boat? Uh, I can, I can start that one off. Um, I think, uh, you know, to, to go back to the, to the awareness of the sits bones beneath you, um, building from there, uh, if you, in, if you imagine your, your pelvis as, as sort of a, a bowl, right? Um, you would, you would like throughout the stroke, for, for your pelvis to move from neutral to tipped a little forward, and then maybe at the release, it's tipped a little backward, but it never tips so much that you get off your sit bones. If you get off your sit bones and you get back on your pockets, you know, again, imagine the bowl of the pelvis. If it's full of water and you tilt it too far back, the water spills out backwards and you don't want to go there. So, you know, thinking in terms of as as you approach the front end or as the front front end approaches you, if you're pulling the boat or letting the boat run out underneath you as, as we preach that you should, uh, your, your, your sit bones and your pelvis are sort of rocking forward so that maybe, maybe a little bit of that water in, in the bowl of the pelvis spills out in front of you. And as you come into the release, it may be tilting backward, but it's, it's a small spill. It's not a, it's not a, gush and everything everything just falls in the cockpit of the boat um so uh, you know th throughout the stroke the pelvis ought to be mobile um having said that when when i uh we we, we, we saw this question before the thing started and I, I was reminded of um of a story that larry gluckman likes to tell about a, a world champion pair and I, I don't remember whether they were belgian or east german or uh dutch i i don't it, it was it was back in the back in the late '60s or early '70s, and these guys sort of rode with the classic C curve back, and so you can imagine that their their pelvises were pretty much tilted backward throughout the entire stroke cycle. And Larry got a chuckle out of it when when he saw them get out of the boat and pick up their oars on the dock because they still had that sort of stooped over C curve back posture as they as they went about their business on land. And and uh, Larry said, you know the the, the posture of the athlete in the boat sometimes is reflected by the posture of the athlete on land. You can, you can make a boat go pretty fast without moving your, moving your pelvis optimally and having absolutely optimal posture. Uh, that doesn't mean it's a, a great idea to, to learn that and make it habitual. Um, Rick, I'll let you take it from here. Okay, Abigail, you and I have worked together before. What, what the question, if I heard it correctly, you said you move around a lot on the sea. So if you're moving around a lot on the sea, that to me is somewhat of a red flag for you. I've worked with you before. And if you're moving around because you're not comfortable, then I think you need to talk or you need to figure out what you can do to correct, possibly correct the, the space between your sit bones relative to this uh, on the seat relative to the space that is naturally your sit bone space, so to speak. So if you're moving around and you're not comfortable, um, that's not a good thing and you got to work on that. You and I can email again separately about how to possibly address that. So that moving around caught my attention. Uh, this afternoon I had practice with my team and one of the things that we do is we do this pelvic tilt, reverse pelvic tilt where you're on all fours and the, the guys have named it the, 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 the bad kitty and the good kitty. The bad kitty is when the back is rounded up like a kitty or a cat that's like ready to snarl or something. And then the good kitty would be the one where the back, lower back is concave. So pelvic tilting and reverse pelvic tilting, as Troy talked about, is part of it. Also, your knees coming in and out is important. Um, the adduction, in, uh, adduction, abduction of your knees. So at the, as you go in the water, the knees are going to be apart. As you get to the release, your knees are going to be together. The other thing that can help too is keeping your feet loose because I do believe, and this is just me now, um, that there's an, um, a supination pronation on your feet. Supinating would be the outside of your foot. And then as you go into the water, you pronate on the inside of your foot. So keeping your feet loose is important. Um, and, and so you don't want to cinch the shoes down really tight. And this gets into the classic exercise of sculling with your feet out. But um, suffice to say, you can have the same effect with keeping your shoes loose. And then the last thing, just to add to what Troy said, and I've said this at Crassbury many times, 
Um, the sit bones are to sculling what the balls of your feet are to tennis or basketball. The, the sit bones are immensely important in terms of balance, et cetera. And um, you need to be able to get a proper sit bone situation. So um, this question, not just for Abigail, but Abigail, if you're having problems with that, check, check into it further with me on an email. Thank you. Yeah, a couple of things to wrap that up. Um, I think uh, there's, oh shoot, now, I've, now my, my mental train is totally derailed. Uh, to hark back to John's question about body awareness enhancement, when, when, you're, when you're learning to be aware of your sit bones, I, I think that goes hand in hand with, with being aware of, of how your navel moves over the course of the rolling stroke. And, you know, if, if you've got the classic C curve back, then you're, you're sort of, you're, your navel is scrunched down and closed and you've compressed your abdomen. And one of the, one of the best things that I've heard from another coach at Craftsbury, it's a very simple thing, but he, he talked about posturally what you, what you need to think about throughout the stroke is, uh, you know, like being, being in a crowd at an athletic event when something exciting happens on the field or the court and everybody sort of sits up and he, he called it the, the, hey, something's interesting position. And, you know, when, when you're back on your pockets, nothing's interesting. You sit up and your abdomen lengthens and your, your navel opens a bit and, and your navel moves forward and back over the course of the stroke. Um, that's, that, that goes hand in hand with, with pelvic awareness. Um, and, you know, if, if, you're, if you're moving your navel, it's almost inevitable that your pelvis is going to, to move with your navel. Um, and I, uh, gosh, I can't remember the final point that I had. So uh, Erica, let's move on. If I think about it and we have time, I'll hark back to it at some point. Okay, sounds good. Um, so a question now that I think was targeted for Rick, who is frequently mentioning things about coaching the feet. So she asked if you could review that concept, coaching the feet. Okay, um, so it, it's, it's something that I play around with a lot. And um, this is just my take, but coaches have talked about the feet. The first thing is your feet have to be loose. So if you have shoes, keep them loose. Don't make them tight because my way of thinking, if your fingers are going to be loose, your toes have to be loose. You can't have your feet really con confined. So that may mean changing or adjusting the shoes or something to the extent of that. But beyond coaching the feet, of course, the athlete has to coach his or her feet because the coach can't see the feet. So what would I suggest? Uh, I would suggest a couple of things. And the way I make this um, possibly easy is I say, okay, I don't want to talk about what the feet do in between everything but the, but the just before the release and just before the entry. What do I want to see or what do I want to ask the athlete to feel for? So what I like to do is have the athletes in my team sit at the release position with the blades fully in the water, make their toes point as if they were jumping off the floor, make their quad muscles really tight so that their toes are down and their heels are up. And I would say, okay, sit in that position. This gets back to something Jimmy Joy talked about years ago called modeling. So you're sitting statically at the release position. You're in your single, your toes are pointing, your, your toes are down, your heels are up. And I would say, okay, that's what you should be feeling or that's the way your feet should be just before the blades release the water. So that's one end of the stroke, which would be called, that's a plantar flexion. So maximal plantar flexion would occur just as or just before the blades release the water. So what's the, what's the reverse or what's the polar opposite or the rhythmic equivalent of plantar flexion? Well, dorsiflexion. So what's dorsiflexion? Dorsiflexion is when you flex your ankles and your toes curl up toward your shins and you flex your ankles as much as you possibly can. So what would I say? Okay, you want to get into the dorsiflex position when your blade, now this is a little harder because now you're going to be in the air. So you may have to keep this as a mental construct because it's hard to do it in a modeling version. But think, to, think of having maximal dorsiflexion just before the blades go in or as they go in the water. So the thesis I have is that if you get the athlete to focus on the extremes relative to the transition from water to air, which would be the release or the transition from air to water, which would be the catch, everything in between takes care of itself. And you're, you're as, as Fairbairn would say, your unconscious mind fills in all the other gaps. The only other hint I might give you is the idea of when you're, when you're out of the water, think about 
staying on the outside of your feet. And then as you go in the water, think about going on the inside of your feet, which is basically called pronation. You can feel for that. That might also help. So I don't know if that's too complicated, but um, obviously the description I gave you is how you, the athlete, the sculler can coach your own feet and that's up to you and see what happens, see how it works. I don't know if that's clear or not. Okay. So do you want anything to that from your own experience or what? Uh, I don't coach the feet because I can't see them. I need I a see. translucent boat to coach the feet. Okay. When they start making translucent boats, I'll start coaching the feet. Don't you coach uh, your own feet though? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I coach my own feet. Uh, and I, I remembered I remembered what it was that I, that I didn't say about Abigail's question. Uh, I think it's a very common misconception for people outside the sport to note that in rowing and sculling, we are sitting on a seat and therefore to conclude that rowing and sculling are seated sports. And I, I think it's, it's counterproductive to good sculling and good rowing to, to think of them as seated sports because it's not, it's not, most people think of being seated as a passive thing. And obviously rowing and sculling are not passive activities. You're not seated passively you are seated actively, but because we have the connotation of seated being passive, don't think of this as a seated sport. It's, it's not a seated sport. It's, uh, it's a dynamic sport that involves the use of a seat as a, as a launching platform or something of that nature. Hey, Troy, one other thing, I don't know if uh, Marlene Royal is on this talk or not, but I know that Gordon Hamilton at the Florida Rowing Center is really big about emphasizing um, very light connection or light action of your feet relative to the foot stretcher. He talks about that a lot. The other thing I would like to say too, and this is a little bit abstract and maybe somewhat um, odd, but in, in sculling, your feet aren't your feet. The blades are your feet because the blades connect to the water and the water is on the ground. So when you're moving yourself, at least in the, in the water phase of the stroke, in the drive phase of the stroke, your feet are the blades. Your feet are not your feet anymore because the blades are what connects the system to the ground. So the way you treat your foot stretcher dash your feet is different than doing a leg press. And I know Will Ruth is on this call and it's different than doing a squat. So I'll throw that out to you, Will. I saw your name on the list. It's not a squat. And so I think Gordon Hamilton's onto something when he talks about, um, so, and I know when I was coaching college by Norm Graff and by Andy Anderson to drive the foot stretcher into the bottom of the boat all it did is hurt my back. So I'll throw that out to you for any of the people who have a little bit more sculling experience. Your feet are the blades. Your feet are not your feet when you scull. I know that sounds a little weird, but I'll throw it out there. <laughs> Dr. Parnassus, you just, you, you went full, uh, what's, what's the? Um, full Monty. I did the full the, Monty. Do, no, don't bring that up. Uh, what's, what's the guy, the shadow? Uh, uh, um, let's see, Lamont Cranston. Lamont Cranston. You just went full Lamont Cranston and, and flexed your power to cloud men's minds. Okay, sorry about that. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. No, it's, 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 it's great stuff, Rick. Okay. I, I don't, I, I'm not disparaging it at all. Um, you're nothing sorry if not thought-provoking. Erica, what's next? Okay, uh, the next batch of questions kind of deal with like technical approaches and specific drills. So this one kind of holistically approaches that, which is um, this person basically was wondering how to hold on to progress when she's switching her attention from one technical focus to another. So she feels like when she switches her focus away from one area, she kind of loses the changes she'd been making in that area. So. Um, can, can, you, can you read that question as it came in? So she said, what can I do to hold on to progress? For example, when I switch my attention from loose grip and elbows level and out at the release to accelerating through the drive, my elbows might start to drop. It seems I'm in an endless cycle of renewal. Hope this makes sense. Uh, well, to, to start with, we're, we're all in an endless cycle of renewal um, as, as the phrase was used. Um, and we all have that issue of uh, you know, how, how do I, how do I make a change permanent? Um, and you know, the, the simple candid answer is by repeating it tens of thousands of times. Um, something that my novice coach in college said has always stuck with me. 
which is the idea that uh, you, as what, when you are rowing, particularly and especially when you're racing, you, could, you can only hold on to one thought or maybe two thoughts at a time. You, there, there's there's not a lot of uh, there's not a lot of conscious thought going on if you're if you're uh, racing or rowing hard, um, and things have to be you you, ha you have to have faith in what your body does automatically because it remembers what you did the last time, um, and you know by the same token, you can really only work on one thing at a time, and I think the the tendency among uh, inexperienced coaches and inexperienced athletes is to to feel overwhelmed by okay there's there's a hundred things I can see that I need to do better I need to fix those hundred things today and you just can't um, work on one thing at a time if you're making progress keep working it if you're not making progress uh, move down your list to the next of your hundred things that you're that you're judging your sculling disparagingly about and and work on that um, it's it's that you know journey of a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step uh, idea if, if you if you can genuinely improve one aspect of your sculling a day or even one aspect of your sculling a week then it's not going to be that long before your sculling is an awful lot better. Um, I, I spent almost an entire summer working on nothing but catch timing. And at the end of the summer, my catch timing was somewhat improved. I, I could tell it was better. The, the video showed it was better, but I still wasn't satisfied with it. So, uh, you know, we, we are what we habitually do. So, take 10,000 strokes with, with your elbows where you want them. And as, as Larry Gluckman is fond of saying, practice makes permanent. Um, it'll, it'll start to become automatic. It will start to become automatic for you. It won't start to become automatic for you as, as quickly as you'd like it to. And that's, that's life. <laughs> Rick, what, what do you got to add? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I, that question that uh, this person asked is a profound profoundly in, uh, evocative question. And I, I think that, um, you know, as I was listening to Troy and re recollecting in my own experience sculling and coaching at Crashbury for almost 40 years, um, uh, one of the things that I did was I was act, not was, I am actively sculling and also teaching and sculling. And I also, um, um, so anyway, the teaching, teaching coaching part. So I'm teaching other people, I'm teaching myself and coaching myself, and I'm out there doing it and trying to convey what I feel. I think some of this may be a function of the category of what constitutes sculling minutia and what's essential. And I read in a Fairbairn book, and I don't remember where, I've been looking for it for a long time, this very famous English sculler back before the turn of the 20th century said, all you need to know about sculling, you can write on the back of a matchbook. And I remember reading that a long time ago and going, really? Because at that point in time, I had this litany of directives that I was giving the people at Crashbury and giving the people on my team and using them myself. And it was really like, it was, it was such a burden to have all these things to do, like do this, do this, put there, blah, blah. There was this long list of things, almost impossible list of a laundry list, so to speak, of what to do in sculling. And then over time, I started to discover that a lot of the things took care of themselves if I could find some basic act, basic thing to focus my attention on that um, in a sense solved the problem that the minutia seemed to be talking about, if that makes any sense. And so I would propose that you have to be really careful, um, and this is where having a coach and or coaching yourself can be problematic. You gotta be really careful to know what's essential and what's a symptom what's essential and what's a symptom. And I think one of the things with all due respect to coaches, myself included, when I'm coaching, you gotta be very careful that you don't start talking to symptoms as opposed to what the, the, the symptom is saying about something that's more essential, if that makes any sense. And I think unfortunately, sometimes the scholars get caught up in the symptoms instead of getting caught up or getting focused on what the symptom is emblematic of. And so to answer that question, which I think is immensely profound, both as a scholar and also from a coaching perspective, is that um, sculling is a holistic activity. It's a three-dimensional movement in time. 
that trying to make it a linear activity is um, already probably a mistake. So that you can't, as I say to people, you can't have a really good catch or catch timing if you don't have really good release timing. And uh, I know one of the students I work with, I call that rhythmic equivalency, that you have to have a rhythmic balance between two. So for instance, if I'm talking to an athlete and there's something going on with the catch, I also coach the release. The two work with each other. You can't be linear, you have to be holistic. And there's a rhythmic balance between uh, what I call um, um, being 180 degrees out of phase. So the catch and the release are the mirror image of each other. If you don't have a good release, you're not gonna have a good catch. And so my philosophy, which may be different than many of the coaches is that be careful not to talk about the symptoms, keep it holistic, understand that the parts are all interrelated and that the stroke is a folding and unfolding of all these movements that um, at the end of one stroke, all the movements have canceled themselves out. So that there's no erratic, irrational movements left, if that makes any sense. I know this is a little bit esoteric, but I really do think that's a, a great question and um, it's worth probably um, continued discussion in the future. On the, on the topic of, of uh, being holistic, uh, Rick, the, the thing where, where my mind went while you were talking about that uh, was a lot of times you'll you'll pull up next to a scholar and and ask them what they're what they're thinking about or what's uh, what what they're working on, and you'll get a, a, an answer in along the lines of okay, well my my right hand is just not doing what I want it to do, and every time I hear that kind of a an assertion, I'm I'm reminded of something that. Uh, that the the body worker Ida Rolf used to used to say, uh, you know, the, the the problem the problem in your hip probably isn't in your hip. It probably has to do with something that you're doing with your ankle, or maybe the problem in your hip is some something about the way your knee is moving. Um, so I, I think I think we get into a lot of trouble when we blame body parts or or uh, discrete parts of the stroke. Uh, it is it is a it is a whole thing. So. Uh, I, I don't, I don't have anywhere to go with that offhand, but I just wanted to toss that in there. I hope that helps a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you both. Okay. So, so the question is if drills are best viewed as a medicine to be taken when one's sculling is sick or as a daily vitamin taken for maintenance of good, healthy sculling. Rick, you want to, you want to start that one? Um, <laughs> First of all, I don't even like the word drill. I think dr drill is way too drilled instructor-ish. So I think drill is, um, is too militaristic and too disciplined. I like to th use the word exercises. And I would agree with what was in the content of the question that you can, that people who do drills every day, you have to ask yourself, why are you doing that? And I think a lot of times they are actually become the source of a problem, another problem. So. Um, dispensing this medicine in the form of drills, and someone used the question, the, the word medicine, is really problematic and you got to be very careful. When I watch somebody make a mistake or something's going on that might not be quite optimal, um, there may be something I ask them to do that would be helpful in terms of getting him, getting him to a different rhythm. But um, some of the uh, common drills, I think, are... Um, create other problems. And so you don't want to do an exercise, a drill that actually creates another problem. And here I'm going to kind of really probably run right up against Troy. And Troy knows one, one of the exercises I'm talking about. <laughs> the uh, common one that's done very much, which I, I don't prescribe and I, I get very uncomfortable when I see it. Troy knows what I'm referring to, that one third at the catch drill. So um, that one I really just like makes me crazy. Um, but some people really like it and it does work. So I can't disparage the great, like John Graves is really good at that. And he, he doesn't go slow. So I can't say it's bad particularly, but um, I think when you get into the idea of drills, you're getting into a lot of different coaching philosophies. So I'm, I'm really reflecting or, you know, betraying my own um, extreme view of, of what I would use as exercises. Uh, I think one exercise I like is fix sculling with your seat fixed. I like that one. And I think that's not an exercise. It's something you could do for a long, long time. Um, so anyway, I'll leave it. I'm going to throw this back to Troy. He's a little bit more of a traditionalist. 
well, I'm, I'm going to start by, by saying I, I don't think I'm as much of a traditionalist as, as Rick wants to paint me in, in uh, his closing remark. Um, and frankly, I, I, I prefer the term exercises or, or even focuses or foci. I never, I never use the word foci, but I, I, I very rarely use the word drill and I very rarely prescribe drills. And I, if, if, if I'm going to do something that somebody else might call a drill, uh, it, it proceeds, actually, let me back up for a second. Something, something that Rick said, uh, started, I, I first heard him say this four or five years ago, um, that has resonated with me ever since is that the, the sport is about, uh, motion, not effort. Um, and, you know, taking that a step further, I, I turned that over in my mind and thought, okay, you know, there's, the sport is fatiguing. So, you know, it, it involves, it involves effort. And Rick would say, well, don't say effort, say you're putting energy into the system. Um, and I, I don't want this to become too much of a digression. Um, but if, if you proceed from the notion that the effort or the fatigue comes from, from the motion rather than from the effort, uh, you turn that and, and, and apply that to drills. You don't do the drill. The, the drill is not the thing in itself. You, you, you do the drill because you've identified some aspect of your stroke that you're not satisfied with. And you think that that exercise or that drill or that focal point is going to address the thing that you need to address. There's, there's absolutely no reason to go out and do an exercise or a drill because, uh, because that's what we always do. Um, and we, we did a whole webinar on this earlier in the series and um, you, you can find that on, on YouTube along with the rest of them. But um, I, I, would, I would never do a drill or an exercise unless I, unless I had already decided, okay, I need to, I need to work on X. Um, and I, I alluded earlier to, to having spent a long, long part, a big part of one season working just on uh, catch timing and, uh, and getting a, a steeper catch angle. And in doing that, I, I wouldn't say that I did traditional drills, but I, I paid a lot of attention to, to trying to, to feel the blades take the water while my handles were still moving out around the arcs. Because if you, if you watch a sculler's stern shot, you can see immediately whether that sculler is missing water based on as the blades take the water, are the sculler's hands coming back together or are they still moving apart? Or does it happen at that magic moment where they sort of reach the apogee of the arcs, which is sort of uh, orthodoxy would say that's, that's what you're shooting for. Um, to, to, to give a really simple answer to the, to the most basic part of this question that, that Erica started with, uh, are, they, are they medicine for sickness or are they a daily prescription? I, I, I think it's, it's uh, oh, I, I remember what the phrase was, a vitamin taken for maintenance of good, healthy sculling. Uh, I think if, if I have to pick one, it's definitely the latter. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's a vitamin rather than a, than a medicine. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think the, 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 over, the overwhelming message is if you don't, if you don't proceed from, I am doing this exercise for this reason, you shouldn't even do it. Um, and I, I, one, one more really brief story uh, that I, I heard uh, Mike Tatey tell about himself. He said, you know, I, I very, very rarely coach individuals. If, if I see that one guy in the boat, one athlete in the boat is having a particular problem, uh, the whole boat does, does, the, does the drill that I think needs to be done. You know, I don't, I, I don't want people to identify with their mistakes. Um, I, I want to I want to prescribe something that's gonna that's gonna enhance all of the athletes' fundamental understanding of the sport. Um, so that's 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 a little bit far afield, but um, but I, I think we've I think we've answered it. I just would like to say that you know again maybe it's beyond today's talk, but you know, it would be interesting for someone whoever asked the question to propose like a particular quote unquote drill 
And then I would say, well, why do you do that? I would just say in a non-confrontational way, well, why do you do that? Do you know why you do it? What's the purpose of that? Or maybe I could ask their person's coach, like, why are you doing that? What's, what are we trying to achieve here? And, and, and then maybe there would be some reason it was, oh, that's very compelling. Okay, let's, let's do that. But I would want to, um, pardon the expression, drill into the drills to see exactly why they're done the way they're done. And I think in rowing, unfortunately, um, sometimes things get very rote. And it's also, you know, people do what everybody else does and maybe don't really know, or even coaches fall into that trap of doing what everybody else does or what, what they see some national team person do. And they think, well, this is, in, this is why we have to do it because they do it. Uh, that's not really very compelling as far as I'm concerned. So I think this is a question which could be revisited. It's, it's quite a good question. All right. Um, kind of on the topic of knowing the why of drills, I got lots of questions about specific drills, and I don't think we'll have time to cover all of them. But this one person asked about the, the why of rowing with square blades or quarter feather. Basically, which one do you prefer and why? Uh, I'll start that one. I'm going I'm to give a very clear and direct answer. Uh, I, I, I very much prefer quarter feather, and there, there may be uh, blood on the floor if other coaches are listening to this, that the square blades versus quarter feather. I, I feel like quarter feather mimics the, the action, the, the natural action that the blade wants to make at the release, and deliberately keeping the blade square uh, promotes an unnatural release. This, I, I'm not saying that rowing up with square blades has no value. Uh, it's easy to fall into sort of a defensive posture in which you, you, you wind up washing out because you're, you're so defensive about not wanting to get caught at the release. Um, but the, the, the reason that I like quarter feather in itself is that I, I think it, it allows you to sort of take the wrist out of the equation and to maintain a, a very flat aspect to your wrist around the release. Um, and if you, can, if, you can, if you can row quarter feather and train yourself to feel the flat wrist as the blades release, then you can, you can go back to rowing on the feather and you wanna make the release feel similar when you're feathering to the way it felt when, when you were rowing quarter feather. Um, I, I'll, I'll allude again to one of, one of Larry, one of my favorite pithy phrases from Larry, and Larry's got a, a million of these short mnemonic devices. Uh, he, he, he uses the phrase, uh, square out and feather away. And the idea is that the feather should happen as the hands and the handles are traveling back around the arcs toward the next entry, rather than as the, as the handles are coming to the body. And if you watch, you know, you just sit on a sit on a riverbank where people scull a lot, and you watch scullers for a day, you're going to see the vast majority of of scullers perform the feather while the handles are still still traveling toward them on their arcs of of the water phase of the stroke, as Rick calls it, or more traditionally the drive. Almost everybody feathers while they're sort of still on the drive, or while their handles are traveling on the arcs toward the body, and you know, Larry's, Larry's absolutely correct. That, that's, that's a waste of time. It, it may only be hundreds of a second, but if, if you're taking 500 strokes, hundreds of a second add up. You want the feather to take place um, as the handles are traveling away. And quarter feather, I think, facilitates that incredibly well because if you can learn to row quarter feather and let the blades do what they naturally want to do as, as they come out of the water, then it's not that hard to add feathering back in and to make it a less uh, ornate, complex motion. Um, but one, of, one of the things that I, that I talk about a lot in the, in the opening video of session of camps when I, when I head coach a camp is if you, if you, use, if you use a lot of, of wrist in feathering and squaring, that imparts a lot of vertical motion to the handle. If you can just sort of imagine a handle in my hand, it's going to go up and down if I use a lot of wrist. On the other hand, if I, if I just open and close my fingers and don't use as much wrist, I don't impart as much vertical motion to the handle. 
Uh, and one of, one of the things that I'm fond of saying is that sculling is relentlessly horizontal. And if you, if you want to make your sculling as horizontal as you can possibly make it, the first thing you need to do is, is banish excessive wrist action. So uh, long-winded answer to why I love quarter feather, but that's why I love quarter feather. Rick? Uh, what comes to mind in this question as I was listening to Troy, when I first started sculling, um, it was in the, um, the summer of 1979. And um, I had a weary, a Pocock weary and wooden skulls and I was at Connecticut College and I didn't know anything about sculling. Um, and so Bill Stowe, gold medalist in the Olympics um, for the Vesper Bow Club in 1964 was the, was the coach at the Coast Guard Academy. So we were big buddies then. And I said, Bill, you know, uh, can you give me something about sculling? And all he said is, well, when you're sculling really well, you don't use your wrists. That's all he said. And so, and then I never got, he never coached me. I just went out on the water and I was like, how the hell do you do this? Cause when I was coaching at the time at that point in, in my coaching, and also when I was had rode at Trinity using the wrist seemed to be like, and in, in, in high school, that was like what you did, you use your wrists. And um, I used to have tendonitis at Trinity and all kinds of stuff. And so how can you possibly perform this sport, which is very similar to sweep rowing without using your wrists? So because Bill had such credibility um, with me and with everyone else in the rowing community, I was like, okay, if he says it, I got to figure it out. And so I spent a long time trying to figure it out. And I have to say um, for many, many years, both at Crassbury and Connecticut College and wherever I was sculling is trying to figure this out. And um, I would agree with Troy that, in, that the use of your wrist um, is probably not a good idea, uh, at least to any severe extent. Um, the fingers, another part. And um, I don't think I would, I would say at this point, I'm going to say a little more than this because my philosophy, having been doing this for a long time, is pretty radical relative to most coaches. Um, I will say this, that uh, we never, never, at least now, row blade squared, ever, 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 ever. And I, I used to have blade squared. I remember when I was coaching my crews back in the late 80s, early 90s, we'd been blade squared all the time. Subsequently, I've changed my philosophy on this. So I'm an outlier in this regard. So I will probably stop now. But just to say that parts of this I, I'm sensitive to positively and parts of this I'm not so sensitively positive about. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. But um, I think Troy's explanation with the quarter feather is preferable to blade squared. I will say that, and I would prefer that to blade squared, um, and we'll just leave it there. Thank you. <laughs> okay, awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, and that I think actually did address another question that I had, which was about um, keeping one's wrist level while feathering and squaring. Um, so interesting question here came from someone who was actually proposing this maybe as a webinar topic, but I thought you could address it here which was whether you guys have any tips for self-coaching in team boats, so doubles and quads. Wow, <laughs> that's a good one. Troy, you wanna get, you gonna start with this? Uh, uh, well, first of all, I recommend that if you are rowing with your spouse or significant other that you not try to do any self-coaching or any coaching of your spouse or significant other. That's, uh, that's, a, that's a relationship roadblock. Um, you know, honestly, I think, I think if you're going, if, if, if you need to make a substantial adjustment to the way that you row in a team boat, whether, whether that has to do with your specific boat mates or with, uh, well, if, if, that, if that has to do with your specific boat mates, you, you really need a coach. Um, Self-coaching a team boat, um, that viscerally that strikes me as a fool's errand the whole the the old cliche about uh a, a person who represents themselves in court uh as as an attorney as if they were an attorney has a fool for a client um i i think it's 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 awfully hard to it's it's hard enough to self coach in a single and self coaching in a team boat i i just i I'm, yeah just don't just don't um Find find somebody that you trust to to look at you uh, rather than risking uh, risking arguments and and risking the relationship. 
uh, within a team boat? Um, that's that's a tough question, and it's a good question, and I, I wish we had uh, I wish we had more time to think about it and respond uh, more thoughtfully. Um, that's that's just my from the hip response. Uh, you know, I've I've been I've been self coached in my single for years and years, but uh, to to say to say that I haven't had uh, plenty of feedback from the other coaches at Craftsbury and from other scholars who I've uh, trained and, and raced with, um, no nobody nobody is really self coached, uh, and I'm reminded of a, a story that uh, the the famous golfer Ben Hogan somebody asked him. He, he was he was noted for for having one of the great golf swings of his era, and some journalist asked him, you know, where how did you how did you arrive at at the at the particular style of golf swing that you arrived at? And uh, Ben Hogan's answer was, I dug it out of the ground, and you know I, I think it was it was it was a good answer, but it's all it also sort of contains a a, a somewhat disturbing uh, amount of of uh, Arrogance, and I, I love Ben Hogan, and I love Ben Hogan stories. But um, uh, to to some degree, every every single scholar is self coached, but nobody is completely self coached. You just it's, it's it's hard to figure it out on your own. Um, Erica, let's let's move on. I, Troy, I can I sure. can I just Troy add just one thing to this? Go ahead. Okay, what comes to mind, Erica? Um, was my experience at Trinity rowing with Dave Brown. I know Kevin McDermott's on this call. Um, so anyway, if you want to be in, let's just leave it at a double. Well, I was in a pair, but leave it in a double. So you got two people, which could be considered a couple of sorts. All right. If you want to be successful in a team boat, let's just leave it at a double or a pair. The thing you need to do, this is what I did with Dave, or no, this is what happened with Dave. I didn't do it. This is what happened. I had immense respect for my partner. And if anything went wrong, it was always my fault. It was never him. And it was the same way. So Dave Brown never, ever said anything negative about me. And I never, ever said anything negative about him or criticized. I mean, never said anything about what was going on. It was always, if the boat didn't go, it was my fault. We were both very competitive. We were both very fit. And that was the secret to our pair. In fact, with all due respect to my dear coach, Norm, I used to say to Dave, we'd be out there training and going fast. And then I'd say, hey, Dave, you know, when Norm coaches us, we always go slower. Why is that? It just seems like we go slower when Norm coaches us. And I can probably figure out why. But the point being is if you're going to be in a team boat with someone, immense respect. And if something goes wrong, it's never the other person. It's always you. And if both people are of that mindset, then you might go somewhere, especially if you're reason, reasonably well-matched, fit, tough, and really competitive. That's my answer. That, that is, uh, you, you told me that same story in the dining hall years ago, and that remains my uh, favorite Rick story that, I, that I've ever heard. It, it goes, back to, um, goes back to what my, my novice coach, Will Scoggins, used to, used to tell us. He preached all the time, Row, rowing is about trust. And when you're a novice, you have no idea what the coach is talking about when he says that. But the, the way you told the story in the dining hall years ago, uh, you, you put it even more emphatically. You said, you said um, the, the minute you start blaming the other guy, you're done. You might as well get out of the boat. And I, I think that it's, it's profoundly true that if, if you are the sort of sculler or rower who, whose reflexive thought is something's wrong in this boat, who is the joker who's causing this problem? If it's not, if you're not the joker causing the problem, it's none of your business. Um, y y yeah. So uh, you, you told the story better than I can, but I, 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 I will never forget that story, nor, nor Will Scoggins telling us that, uh, that good, good rowing in team boats is about trust. Erica, what's up next? Okay, um, next question kind of pivots a little bit, talk about technology. So Carrie Watterson was wondering if, and if so, how has the use of technology like the speed coach or the stroke coach made coaching more difficult? <laughs> I, I know Rick is gonna tee off on this one. No, so I'm not, I'll let you talk. <laughs> uh, oh, come on, you, you, 
Rick, I, I've, I've heard you, I've heard you go on for hours on this topic um, and, and, and descend into a rant about it. So I, I'm, I'm hoping for at least a, a short rant. Um, I, I think uh, like most technology, uh, speed coaches and heart rate monitors and, and things of that nature, they're, they're a, they're a two-sided coin and they, they can, they can benefit you immensely or they can take away from you immensely. Um, I, I had the thought uh, based on something that Sarah Gronwald said in our ERG webinar about, you know, if, if I think that people get the numbers in their head and you become, you come to identify with certain splits or certain stroke rates and then you, you become frightened of stroke rates that are higher than the stroke rate that you're comfortable with. And you become frightened of, of erg splits that are faster than you think you are capable of maintaining. And I had the thought driving either yesterday or today that if, if the coach could recalibrate the speed coach or the erg monitor in such a way that it would read a, a different split, uh, that, the, that the athlete was comfortable with, the athlete would be capable of, of, a, of a better performance because they, they wouldn't know that they were having to put more energy into the system to produce the output that they're getting. Uh, we, we, we can get very wound up about the numbers. So, you know, I think, and, and, and of course, there's, there's the postural aspect of if you're always staring at the monitor of your speed coach, your head goes down, your, your spine curves over, uh, your sternum lowers. Um, there, there are all kinds of good reasons uh, to, to do a lot, to take a lot of your strokes, either with, with the speed coach not in the boat or, or uh, I've, I've mounted the speed coach behind me before just so that I could record my data without obsessing about the data in the moment. The, but th by the same token, it can be incredibly beneficial to get real-time feedback. I sometimes I, I have the experience of uh, if, if my catch timing is a little off or the the rhythm of my drive is a little off and I remind myself of of an aspect of what I'm trying to to make the stroke feel like or to make the catch feel like I can I can see a pretty clear and immediate change in my split based on the technical change that I made. So you know, I, I think technology can can be beneficial in one context and a detriment in another. Uh, we we actively discourage people from using speed coaches during our seven o'clock rows. Uh, we don't want people staring at the staring at the screen all the time. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't ever want anybody to use a speed coach. Um, so, Rick, I. I'm, I'm probably going to get grief about this because I said my answer was going to be uh, direct and succinct and it wasn't, and I've already done that once. But anyway, Rick, what do you got? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think that Troy sort of let the cat out of the bag with regard to my philosophy of technology in regard to the sport. Um, and I'm not talking about a coxswain. I'm talking about a sculler or a, a, co a co If you have a coxswain, then it's a whole different game. But if you're a sculler without getting you know, too esoteric, I would argue um, that the, um, the present, let's put it this way, the present technology uh, perhaps could be improved um, in a fundamental abstract way to make it more um, in keeping with the characteristics that um, an athlete needs or the feedback an athlete needs um, to perform well in the moment. So I guess one of the things that I've talked about to, with some of my students is audible feedback as opposed to visual feedback. And I think right now, most of the technology or, that I know of, and I'm not, I'm not a student of it, most of the technology is fundamentally is visual. And I think the visual feedback is not the mode of information that the athlete needs to um, perform better. But Again, that may be a limitation on my athleticism or my mind or something. So I can't say that anyone can't benefit. But I know for me, or for my theory of, of the sport, that audible would be immensely more valuable than visual. Um, 
There could also be tactile feedback theoretically with microprocessors and all that stuff, which I'm vaguely um, familiar with that possibly there's things in the future that will uh, enhance the sport. But suffice to say, um, uh, I agree with Troy, you gotta be very careful with the electronics and the technology. I'm sure there's some people that are very flexible in their ability to switch from one mode to another instantaneously. Um, be very careful. The idea of putting your head down is immensely, immensely detrimental in my opinion to the sport for all kinds of reasons that are subtle, but perhaps very significant. So um, I don't mean to um, disparage all the companies that make technological devices for the sport, but um, frankly, I think there's a ways to go yet. And I'm looking for someone to be really creative um, outside the box, so to speak, of what is presently done, because some of the assumptions that go into those technological devices uh, could be questioned. So I'll leave it at that. Uh Two, two real quick things I've, I, have, I have wondered before and, and wished that uh, NK or somebody would come up with, uh, with an audible signal whereby you could set your speed coach to tell you if your stroke rate drops below X or if your stroke rate goes above X or if your split drops below X. Uh, that, that would certainly solve the problem of, of the postural problem anyway. It might not solve the problem of, of uh, obsessing over the data. Um, and I, I heard a rumor, I don't know if it's true, maybe somebody can, can address this, but uh, I heard a rumor that at the, at the highest level of uh, the British national teams rowing, they actually have some heads up displays that allow the sculler to see their own sculling in real time as it happens without changing their posture because they're, they're wearing some sort of uh, goggle or visor that allows them to see that. I, I, I don't even know if it's true. Great question. Hey, Troy, I saw, I'm looking at some of the questions that came up on the chat through my, my end. So there are some other questions that came up from, from people in the chat um, area. So that perhaps would be helpful. I'm not sure. Uh, you're not, you know me, I'm not completely conversant with this technology, but um, I know Geraldine Goss has a question here. Given the bow side gate is slightly higher and allow the crossover of the hands, does this extend to the catch or does the left hand need to rise up to be at the level with the right? Oops, bow side equals starboard. Is that, did you hear what I just said, Troy? I did. Yeah, that's Geraldine Goss's question. It's a little bit of a rigging question. I would say, no, Geraldine, my philosophy is that the bow side or the starboard side is approximately a half inch or so higher than the port side in most boats. And that relationship has to be maintained throughout the whole stroke. So it doesn't change, it stays the same. Um, and that has some implications actually for the timing of the entry of port relative to starboard, if you wanna get really particular about it. But to, I think if I'm reading your question right, Geraldine, um, the starboard side is higher and it's always higher throughout the whole stroke, if that helps. So I hope that helps. Um, uh, I, okay. there, there's a, there's a related question, um, from Brenda Austin. Uh, do you have a, a mantra or saying I can use to help increase my comfort and hence patience at the entry? And w while you were answering Geraldine's question about, uh, starboard, starboard or lock or bow side or lock, if, uh, if she prefers that terminology being higher than, than stroke side or port, um, My, my mantra that, I, that I'm going to suggest for Brenda is actually going to, uh, to seem like a contradiction of what you just said about the, the relationship stays the same throughout the stroke. Uh, comfort at the front end, uh, besides just doing a lot of sitting and a lot of stationary drills that involve being at the front end and getting your nervous system more accustomed to that strange and vulnerable environment and making it seem less, uh, less of a vulnerable place, less of a dangerous place. Um, what, what I've found very helpful over the years in my sculling is, is thinking about, and this, this is the mantra, weight in the middle, handles at the same height. And uh, Rebecca Caro of, of uh, um, it's not real perfect anymore, but uh, she, she chastised me one time about using that as a mantra of what, well, the handles aren't at the same height because the oarlocks are at slightly different heights. Uh, 
And I, I just think it, it, it keeps the mantra more, more succinct. And I don't, I don't think it really, I don't think it's harmful to think about keeping your handles matched at the catch uh, because we are only talking about a, cent a centimeter or a centimeter and a half of difference. Um, so long and the short of it, I was, I was out sculling in early April at Craftsbury and that's, uh, that's shortly after ice out most years and the water was still very cold and I was going through the narrows and uh, I, was, I was out, there was no safety launch on the water and, and I, uh, arguably I, I shouldn't have been out there because I was in violation of the 100 degree rule, but it was a relatively sunny day so I felt okay about it. But I got up to the narrows and I, and I got a little nervous and anxious and I thought, you know, the water's really cold. You know, I'd, it, it would be miserable if I, if I flipped today. Um, and, you know, to, to hark back to John Livingston's question, um, the, my, my neurological state shifted because of my anxiety about the temperature of the water. And then within a couple of strokes, I had the thought, all right, and I, I don't usually speak to myself in the third person, but I, I did it that, on that occasion. I said, you know, all right, Troy, you're the comfort in the boat guy. Um, you, you, can't be, you can't be scared at the, at the front end just because the water's cold. Just remember, wait in the middle, handles at the same height, everything's gonna work out. You, you can't capsize the boat without one of your oar handles dropping precipitously. So if you, if you if you have faith and practice having faith in keeping your weight over the keel and your oar handles matched up pretty well, especially at the front end, um, that's, that's the, the mantra I would suggest for, for Brenda or for anybody else. Um, comfort and, and patience at the entry. Um, weight in the middle, weight over the keel, oar handles at the same height, or oar handles at heights that produce even keel, which are centimeter and a half different because of the orlocks. Okay, um, sounds like Erica's back. Um, Erica, you got a new one? So the next thing that I had been planning on getting into, I, I got several questions about head racing that were actually all incredibly similar. Um, so three different people wanted to talk about basically navigating, steering, and turning during head races. So one person was talking about specifically the 180 degree turns like in the Green Mountain Head, other people just in terms of like generally making quick turns at full pressure, at race pace. Um, one person specifically mentioned that they have no trouble navigating when they're at a lower or more moderate pressure and stroke rate, but once they're up to head race pace, they find it a lot harder to steer. So yeah, generally, general thoughts on those topics. Uh, Rick, I was talking a lot on the last question, so uh, why don't you start this one? Okay, well, uh, another uh, excellent endeavor, big question. What I like to tell people, and, 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 and uh, Erica finished it off, she said, as, as you go faster, it's more difficult. Well, that's partly due to the nature of a shell. The faster it goes, the more it wants to stay straight. So um, I don't think Diane Davis is on this talk, talk but when she was really intent upon doing well at the head of the Charles, I said, you know, Diane, get a Van Dusen. It's banana shaped and it steers really well because there's a lot less a stern and bow connection. You can turn the boat. It turns almost on its center point. But suffice to say, when you're at the head of the Charles, the big mistake I've made um, in, in, in years past is when you're racing at the head of the Charles and you want to turn under the Weeks footbridge, don't try to get more power on starboard take slow down on port. So you're already going at full speed. Let's say you're at quote unquote full power. You're going at full, full speed. You're at 30 strokes a minute. You're going up there. You just went through the, um, the Western Avenue bridge. You're, you're heading up to the Weeks footbridge. You got to make a turn to port. Don't try to go harder on starboard, ease up on port. Slow the movement down on port. Don't try to go faster, harder on starboard. So in essence, the stroke ra uh, racing a head race is a little bit like those race cars where they race in, I think it's called Le Mans, where they race in Europe around city streets. And you gotta go very fast, then you gotta make a turn, then you gotta go very fast. So the best way to make turns, in my opinion, at the head of the Charles, is to always remember when you're going really fast from the Wood Foot, Weeks footbridge, say, to the Anderson Bridge, you gotta make that turn to starboard, ease up on starboard and the boat will come around the starboard. If you try to go really fast under the bridge, you're gonna go right into the Harvard Boathouse and I did that one day. So <laughs> all I'm saying is that's gonna be one of the, the, the key points of head racing is to be able to understand that when you're in a head race, 
you have to be able to slow down and speed up with a, with a lot of skill. And so one way to get better at head racing is to practice slowing down and speeding up and then practice turning by easing up on the side you want to turn to. Slow, actually not easing up as much as slowing down a little bit. And I like to talk about the speed of motion as opposed to pressure. So instead of going with less pressure on starboard, I slow the motion down on starboard and keep the motion speed a little bit more on port and the boat goes right to starboard. So that, that would be my take, very short take on steering a head race. Troy, you want to take it? Uh, yeah, I, I actually have a, what I, what I think is an interesting story about uh, weak split bridge and uh, for, for, for anybody who's not familiar with with that turn in the head of the Charles it's a it's a pretty steep turn to port and you know the the architecture of the bridge and the surrounding buildings and the trees and just the sort of the, uh, the the visual aspect of that turn is pretty tricky and there are uh, two things that spring immediately to mind and one is that Turns have to be anticipated, and and you need to know what your line. It, what 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 do you want your line to be going into that turn before you actually have to start turning? Uh, and good coxswains are are incredibly valuable in this uh, in this scenario. And obviously, when you're a single sculler or you're in any sculling boat, you're not going to have a coxswain. So if you know if you're the single, you are effectively your own coxswain. So you have to anticipate what's my line going to be. And um, it's 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 sort of amazing how many people don't reflexively uh, know their just pay attention to where their stern is pointing throughout their their sculling outings. Um, when, when I go down for the head of the Charles and, and do my tour of the course the, the day before the race, um, I, don't, I don't roll a lot on the Charles. Maybe, uh, you know, if I'm lucky, I get on the Charles five days a year. Uh, and the first thing I do is start refamiliarizing myself with what, what's my stern point at this point on the course? Um, you know, how, what, where, do, where do I feel like the starboard shore is? Uh, as I'm going through the Western Half Bridge, and and where do I where do I want to start to anticipate the turn into the Weeks Bridge? Um, and the the really the really quick story that that I'll I'll tell about my own difficulties with the Weeks turn. Uh, I, I was at, we we usually launch from from CRI, and um, Greg Benning was down there one day, and of course uh, Greg is a is an absolute master and holds I think multiple course records in in several age categories for the for the head of the Charles so I thought I'd just ask him it's like how do you how do you handle the week's footbridge and the first thing he told me was you know don't don't try don't worry about taking full strokes as you go under the bridge um, you know the the turning forces in the boat are most influenced by that steep catch angle at in the at the beginning of the drive phase and he said, you know, I, I, don't, I don't even try to take full strokes going under the weeks footbridge until I have made the turn to my satisfaction and I know that I'm going to come out on the line that I want to have coming out. And, you know, I, just this lightning bolt moment of, gosh, why didn't I ever think of that before? It's a pretty simple concept. Um, you know, emphasize, emphasize the steep catch angle, release the blades early, uh, get in more strokes under the weeks bridge as, as you – lighten up on port and maintain your pressure on starboard. Uh, it worked like a charm. I made, I made the week's footbridge turn much better the last two years since I got that advice from Greg. And uh, I'm, I'm sort of ashamed of being a sculler for 30 years and not ever having thought of that myself. Oh, there, there was another aspect of this question, which was this, the, the idea of a stake turn or, or even a 90 degree turn uh, at, um, at something like the Green Mountain Head. Um, typically, turns around stakes or around two buoys at, uh, on an out and back head race like that, uh, it's almost always a counterclockwise race. And so you're gonna wind up uh, dragging on port. And my, my best advice to Bill or, or anybody else is to, in, in the weeks leading up to the race that you know you're gonna have to make a stake turn, you, you need to practice full speed, dragging the boat down 
jamming that port blade in the water and just getting to where you're no longer afraid to make that a pretty aggressive move. Um, if, if, you, if you baby it, it's gonna take you many strokes to make your turn. And if you can really get comfortable with the idea of just sinking that blade and letting the boat pivot around that port blade, um, practice, practice that over and over again in the weeks leading up to, to that sort of a race. Okay, question from Ken Novak uh, about, he was saying, you know, 30 strokes per minute, so each stroke takes two seconds. Uh, how would you best apportion those two seconds to the stroke cycle? Oh, I, I, I love that question, and I, I, I want to give a very, I, I keep promising succinct answers. This one actually will be succinct. Um, to, to, to some degree, Ken, you don't have any choice about how to apportion those two seconds because the, the, the amount of time that the blade stays in the water at any given stroke rate uh, is largely, if not, well, it, it is mostly determined by how fast the boat is already traveling. Um, sometimes you see scullers uh, that they seem to think that they can reduce the time on the drive to zero. It's like, I'm, I'm gonna rip my blade through the water so fast that it will only stay in the water for one tenth of a second and then I'll have 1.9 seconds to, to just relax on the recovery and chill. It doesn't work that way because the boat has to travel past the blade as, as the blade is in the water. Um, so, you know, what, 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 you, what you really need to focus on is your, your drive rhythm, and making the release as clean and uneventful as you can possibly make it. And that will maximize the amount of time that you can spend on the recovery. But, you know, at, at 30 strokes a minute, my, my guess without reviewing Valery Kleshnev's data, the blade's gonna stay in the water somewhere between eight and nine tenths of a second. And you're gonna have between 1.1 and 1.2 seconds on the recovery. Um, don't waste it with a sloppy release. Don't waste it with a with a uh, with a catch that isn't direct. Um, but this this is mostly a question of drive rhythm rather than of apportioning time. Rick, um, I would basically agree with that. Although I I will throw in a Parnassian uh, perspective here, which I think is reasonable to uh, if you buy into the Concept Two website about the blade stalling. And it seems to me that if the blade slows down sometime between the catch and the release, then your seed has to slow down too. Something has to slow down. So therefore, there's going to be more time spent at the stall. So in the uh, rhythm of the drive, so to speak, you use the word like 0.8. In the 0.8, okay, it's 0.8 from catch to release. But during that period of time during the drive, how is that 0.8? Is it 0.8? Is it, is it, how does that actually... Um, manifest itself through a, through the drive, so to speak. So if the, if the blade is stalling at some point momentarily, wouldn't you want to assume that your seed has to slow down as well? In which case, the 0 0.8, if you looked at it and broke it down into more fine uh, increments, that 0 0.8 would not be uh, a linear 0 0.8. It would have a, a slow spot and a fast spot that is um, representative of the rhythm that the blade in the water um, shows if you buy into the Concept2 website. So I throw that in there as um, a further uh, refinement of the discussion, which I think is, again, one of those questions that could be um, chewed on for quite a while. Thank you for that, Ken. Okay. You got it, Erica. Okay, so I think we're, I mean, we're getting almost to 5.30 and I still have quite a few questions, but we haven't even touched on the areas of equipment and rigging. So I think I'll jump to those now. Uh, so I really like this question coming from Guy Linz who asked, um, regarding the equipment, why has appar there apparently been so little real progress since the sport began? And he asked if anything revolutionary happened with the oars or the shell that would be comparable to what happened in other sports. Um, and whether you could, and whether you could extrapolate whether that would translate to sea changes in results if there were such ra radical changes in equipment. Rick, go ahead. Want to go first, Troy? No, I want you to go first. Okay. Uh, basically, I would say uh, clearly people are going faster than they used to, 
And some of that has to do with hatchet blades. I certainly think so. I mean, the hatchet blades have really changed the sport in that regard. So there's no question that the sculler from, you know, 1964 uh, Olympic champion, which was Vasilislav Ivanov, I think he was about six, seven minutes. Clearly to win the Olympics now in a single on the men's side, you have to go, I don't know, 647, 648, something like that. So why have they gotten faster? I think from an equipment perspective, the hatchet blades have certainly facilitated that. Uh, I think the equipment is a little bit stiffer and that may in some cases, depending on the size of the sculler, have enhanced that um, sea change in the sport. Um, the other part I think is not an equipment based, which is another discussion is training based. Um, one thing that I think is important to remember about sculling, um, and this is something that probably Will Ruth, who's on this call, could also reflect on, is how much faster is a human being able to go in a, in a single um, from over 2,000 meters in flat conditions? What's the, what's the limit? And I know they've done this in running and various other sports. They've done calculate, they meaning exercise physiologists, have done sp sport calculations about what the optimal a terminal velocity, for lack of a better term, would be. And I don't know what that is, but in eights, it's gone down, you know, substantially. In singles, it's gone down. Um, and it may be that, but I don't think you're going to find a single sculler going 540 for 2K flat water, but you might see somebody going closer to five, six, 630. Um, and so that's a good question. But I think the answer is Guy's question, at least on the surface, the hatchet blades and possibly the stiffness of the rigor and the equipment, depending on the size of the sculler, um, has helped or improved the performance. That's my take. What do you think, Troy? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't have an awful lot to add to that. I, I mean, I think you're correct that probably the, the biggest speed jump is the result of the change in blade design. Um, certainly composites and again I'm, I'm echoing you composites have added a, an awful lot of stiffness to the system and you don't, you don't lose as much energy with with things flexing uh anymore um i, I don't want to get into arguments with with traditionalists about wooden boats and so on and so forth and the you know um but i i, I do think that most of the speed gain uh is is the the natural progression of the improvement of training um you know human beings are still human beings but uh we we have better training pro protocols uh and the the sport has a lot more participants um two generations ago if you could sneak under seven minutes on flat water for 2k in a in a men's single race you were almost guaranteed to to win any race up to it including the olympics uh, now, if you can go under seven minutes, then uh, you're not even guaranteed a spot in the B final anymore. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think I think it tra training methodology uh, is is a I, I don't want to say a larger contributor, or maybe I do. Um, yeah. Okay. Great. Um, okay, a couple more rigging questions. So one person was asking about optimizing the location height-wise of one's shoes on the foot stretcher, um, wondering if the rule is higher the better, as long as you have sufficient flexibility to still get into a solid compressed couch position. Uh, you go, Troy, you want me to take this one first? I, I was actually answering a private question in the chat, so I, I didn't even hear the question. I'm going to have to derive it from your answer or ask Erica to repeat it. So why don't you go first? Okay. As far as shoe height goes, <clears throat> uh, the shoe height and the angle of the foot stretcher, the height of the heels relative to the seat, display of the feet um, will affect the uh, performance of the sculler. And um, again, this is somewhat of a, a stylistic question. Uh, you see this in in the world championships or the Olympics, it seems to run in sort of like, um, uh, there's a, there's a, like a, what's in style at the moment. There was a period of time when the feet seemed to be really high and no one's shins were at right angles to the, to the keel or uh, to the water and their catch and release, their catch angle was relatively uh, acute. The release angles weren't foot stretches or way to the stern. The idea being uh, that you were gonna push, you could better push the boat forward with your legs if your feet were higher. That actually goes all the way back to Carl Adam in the Ratzeberger uh, generation of the 60s. So I think that there is some stylistic, technical, 
I don't know, use the word philosophical type um, maxims that you want to use before you make those decisions. Um, but I can tell you for sure, if your shoes are really high and the angle's really steep, um, there's going to come a point when your legs get in the way, so to speak, of your feet and, um, or your knees get in the way of your chest, I guess is a better way to say it. And you will not be able to get as much of a catch angle unless, of course, you move your foot stretcher way to the stern, but then you're going to have some issues at the release, in my opinion. So um, rigging, rigging uh, philosophies are always, at least should be, based on the way you percept, the way the coach or the athlete um, um, presupposes the, um, the essence of the stroke. And so um, uh, that, I think, is the answer I could give you until we got more specific. But I would be very careful about raising your shoes too high. And you can feel the difference uh, quite dramatically, again, depending on your, your inseam length and the proportion of your, your lower leg to your upper leg. So go ahead, Troy. Yeah, in, 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 a, in a perfect world, um, you know, the, the, the physics and, and biomechanics of the situation would, would tell you that you need to have your feet as uh, not, not as high as possible, but the, the closer you've got your feet to the level of your hips, the better mechanical advantage you have. But by the same token, if the athlete is, is in an uncomfortable position, it doesn't matter what kind of mechanical advantage they have. They're, they're, you, don't, you don't perform optimally when you're uncomfortable. So there's got to be some, some compromise uh, between the athlete's most uh, maybe not most comfortable position, but putting the athlete in a position where she can do work and not feel uncomfortable in doing the work. Um, so th there's, there's, no, uh, there's no magic one-size-fits-all formula. Uh, it's it's going to be a little bit different for, for each individual. We had a, we had a GRP athlete who uh, drove us a little bit bananas as coaches because she liked having her feet as low as she could possibly set them. And she, she could easily overcompress. She had plenty of flexibility. She could get her shins far past vertical if she wanted to. And we, we tried to convince her to raise her shoes, but uh, she, she went fast with shoes low in the boat. That's where she liked it. That's where she was comfortable. In the end, we left it alone. Uh, one thing I want to just throw out to you, this is a, a sidebar, but it has to do with shoe height. In the, in the famous book, Rudern, which is a translation of the East German book, that was done in the 70s um, by Herberger, they have a, a statement about the, the uh, foot stretcher angle. And they say in the book without an explanation, the men should be, men should be 45 degrees, women should be 42 degrees. They don't say why. So for many, many years, I used to cite that um, as part of a, a general rigging chat, uh, but I never really knew why. And then subsequently this summer, I was sculling a lot. And one day it dawned on me and I'm not sure this is the, the real answer because I, I don't know, but I'm guessing that the difference between 45 for men and 42 for women has to do with the Q angle that women have, which is a greater Q angle, which if you're familiar with the, the, the width of the hips and the position of the thighs going in, the thigh bones going into the hip socket. So I think to answer my own inquiry, the Q angle has something to do with the fact that women, at least from the East German perspective, had a little bit less um, foot stretcher angle uh, than men. That's my guess. I, I can't prove it. I might actually consult with Will Ruth about this one uh, or someone else who has uh, some more knowledge about a human anatomy. Okay, great. Um, two more questions. And that's it. So I apologize if we weren't able to get to yours. Um, Margo Miyashiro asked, uh, she said, there are many different things that you can adjust on rigging. And she wondered how you would prioritize what to change first. And if there's a certain ideal that you're going towards when making rigging changes. Wow. Go, Troy. <laughs> you want that one, Troy? Uh, I'll, 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 yeah, I'll start it. Um, uh, you know, First, first and foremost, I, I think you start with, with your foot stretcher placement. Um, and there's, there's some latitude for personal preference in foot stretcher placement, but you know, it, coaches, coaches call it finding the arcs. And you, you've got to find your arcs first and figure out what your optimal foot stretcher placement is. And I think from there, you, you, go, to, you go to oar length and, and inboard ratio of inboard to outboard. Uh, 
and that's that's what you start with. Uh, I'm I'm going to pitch this one back to you, Rick. Okay. Well, I I uh, for many years uh, have done mo most of the rigging talks on the week or weekends because I like rigging. Um, although I want to have a, a disclaimer, you can't rig yourself to fame. <laughs> so don't think rigging is this sort of magic that can take you away from all the other things that uh, constitute a really good performance athletically. But that said, you can't have a boat that's poorly rigged for a particular individual. A rigging, it's called rigging, I call it a rigging system where there are different rigging systems based on the athlete's uh, body proportions, uh, level of flexibility, strength, et cetera, experience sculling, and um, size of the boat. So there's a lot of variables um, that come into it, but um, I would extend what Troy said. I might look at the person's ability to get a catch and release angle. I think those are important depending again on their flexibility. Um, I've worked with some people about getting smaller, smaller, um, or shorter oars and more of a, a tighter inboard. I'm sorry, not a tighter inboard, a tighter uh, span, which is the distance between the pins relative to the keel, changing your inboard. Um, for people that are on the extremes, whether you're, you know, very petite without a lot of um, stature, perhaps is the way to say it, or if you're really big, then, um, and very tall, then you have to be really aware of the rigging. And unfortunately, a lot of times, if you're in a club boat where a lot of people are using it, invariably, some percentage of the people using that boat are going to be disenfranchised due to the fact that you can't have one size fit all. It's a little bit like trying to have one pair of shoes for everybody to run in. So um, I don't mean to make this more complex. Um, the person who asked the question, um, Erica, if she or anyone else wants to send me an email, I'd be happy to send a few more ideas out. Rigging is a really fascinating and important aspect of the sport. Um, a lot of coaches are impatient with it because it can take up a lot of time. Um, and also you need a proper equipment. So if you really want to get serious at sculling, you're going to have to get your own shell or find a shell that's just for you and then start working on the rigging. It's also a process that takes, takes an eye of someone who knows the variables and how they affect your performance to f eventually come to a rigging um, position that's optimal. And that usually follows the athlete's um, progress as a sculler. But um, uh, it's, it is important. And un unfortunately, it's something that a lot of coaches don't have the time or experience to implement, um, sadly. And so I try to do the best I can when I'm giving the rigging talk at Crashbury to help people at least to get them in the right ballpark so they're familiar, if nothing else, with the terminology. So. That reminds me of a story that I heard repeated many times about uh, George Pocock, and he was, he was griping about international results and he said you know when we were winning the three hours of rowing were rowing rowing and rowing and now the three hours of rowing seem to be rigging rigging and rigging and we can't win anything um to 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 echo rick you you can't rig your way to speed but you can miss rig your way to slowness i've seen people get obsessed over millimeters i'll tell one really brief story i i went out for a row one day and i didn't notice that I had a clam on one oar and, and I did not have a clam on the other oar. And I was marveling during my row at how straight I was going. And you know, some, someone who is obsessed with, mil, with millimeters would say, well, that, that's impossible. You, know, you, changed, you changed your rig and you, you had a giant imbalance and you know, maybe, maybe it just, you know, maybe you got lucky and it, it, it redressed your imbalance. The lesson I took from it was that Millimeters and sometimes even centimeters may not be that critical. And the story that I always tell when I do the rigging talk is that uh, we, we got a boathouse full of boats. And if you take a really good sculler and put that sculler in any of our boats, as long as the boat is not wildly too small or wildly too large for that sculler, that sculler is going to be able to make that boat go pretty fast. Um, so again, I, like Rick, I'm not knocking rigging, rigging, rigging's important, but it's, it's largely about, uh, producing a rig that the sculler is comfortable in and can do work in and, uh, don't, don't get obsessed over the millimeters. The one exception being, uh, your, your starboard and port pitch need to be very close to the same. Otherwise you're going to have one oar that wants to dig and one oar that wants to wash out. Erica, let's, uh, let's have the last question. Um, I'd, I'd okay. love to stay all night and, and talk with Rick, but uh, I, I don't know that everybody in the audience feels that way. So let's wrap it up. Okay. So the last question is pretty open-ended, but it's basically just what is one thing that each of you wishes that 
sorry, one thing that each of you knows that you wish everybody else also knew? Oh. That's, that's a great question. Um, my, my from the hip answer, uh, I've, I've got two. And one goes back to the doc talk that, that we give on the first day about being able to tell uh, if a sculler is a proficient sculler just based on seeing that sculler sitting at the catch with their blade square. Um, you know, I, I hear a lot of coaches talk about, well, that's, that's the most vulnerable position in the stroke. That's the tippiest place in the stroke cycle. Um, and as, as long as that remains a, a place that makes you anxious, uh, you're, you're, you're going to be limited in your, in your ability to improve your sculling. Um, so the, the matter of training your nervous system to be comfortable in a position where as a novice, you were very uncomfortable. That's incredibly important. And I wish everybody knew that. Uh, the, the other thing that I, that I wish, uh, ev everybody knew, uh, I'll, I'll keep this brief it cause it gets, you know, the catch is a very complicated, uh, Catch is a very complicated thing, and we could spend all day talking about the catch, but uh, the something that I learned from swimming is that if, if I allow the momentum of my body to place that to place my hand that's reaching forward and I allow the momentum of my body to have that hand toward the wall before I try to move myself past the hand, I swim faster. And I think the same thing is absolutely true of sculling. If, uh, if, if you allow the blade time to find the water and the momentum of the shell to, to load up the blade before you load it up with your suspension and your, and your muscular activity, you will go faster than if you try to grab the water with the blade. Um, and, you know, that's people, people spend uh, years, if not decades, if not their entire sculling experience, trying to trying to master catch timing, and I I think it, it starts with an understanding of what you're what you're actually trying to achieve. Um, Rick, over to you. Okay, I'm going to be a little bit less specific, but I just wrote down to myself the que the question I which I think the person is asking, what do I wish I knew then that I that I do know now. And, and, and there's a lot of things about the sport that I have learned over the course of I'm almost 50 years of coaching and 40 years of sculling. Um, so I've learned a lot and continue to learn. And um, I would say, um, and we've already talked about it, curiosity, no self-admonishment. And then the other part that's a kind of an abstract thing, which is maybe more relevant to some than it would be to others. What, um, nothing is ever what it seems. And a lot of the mistakes I made sculling or coaching were because um, what I thought was happening was actually not happening. And almost, I would say, um, and I say this to some people, whatever you think sculling is, it's probably the opposite. So just keep that in mind that it's really a fascinating sport because what apparently seems to be the case is most, 100% mo of the time, unless you're just incredibly intuitive, um, probably the opposite of what you think. And that can go for every part of the stroke. So I, as a sort of as a way of keeping the, your mind open to looking at what I would say the secrets of sculling, there's a lot more to it than it seems. And it, for most people, it's, it's really very counterintuitive, which makes it a great sport. Thank you. Okay. I, I, I think that's a good note to end on. Um, let's, uh, Let's leave it there. Erica, cue the outro music. We'll, uh, we'll see everybody next week, or maybe we won't, but uh, we, next week is going to be the finale, and it's going to be a, a bunch of Craftsbury coaches um, sharing the, the best thing that they've learned at Craftsbury. Uh, so where, where this one was all Q&A, next week's is, is going to be all Craftsbury stories of, of professional development and, and personal uh, uh, fulfillment, personal fulfillment. Thank you, Rick. Um, we, Erica, be sure to put that in the blurb that we put on the website. We'd be <laughs> come come to next week's webinar, and you will achieve personal fulfillment and total consciousness. <laughs> Noted. 
Okay, should I cue up the outro music? We're waiting for it. Okay. Uh, so if you haven't heard already, this music was the result of the joke Troy has been making about um, eating outro music to make it less awkward at the end of our webinars. So this was created, composed, and um, recorded by a couple of our guests who Marisol and Chris Cohorn sent it to us and graciously told us to use it. So thanks very much to them. And, uh, so now we'll get to enjoy it for a few minutes while we uh, wait for the end. Shout out to Erica, by the way. Great job, Erica. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thanks, everybody. Baby. Rick, I, I remember uh, you, you used the word counterintuitive toward the end of your conclusion there. And I remember one time uh, a camper saying that something was counterintuitive. And your, your uh, response was, it's not counterintuitive. You just don't have, you just have faulty intuition. <laughs> I'm, I'm really sorry you said that. You really disparaged my reputation. I, I said that <laughs> as a joke. <laughs> I'm just quoting you. You did. You're right. I did say it. I, I, I confess I did say it. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was funny. I think, and I think, the, I think the camper thought it was funny. It was, it was it, it intended in the spirit of fun. And I, I think it hit the mark. You got any color? Yeah, the, yeah, foliage. <laughs> nice. The best yeah. is this way, yeah. <laughs> Erica's gonna wander too far from the Wi-Fi and that's gonna end the meeting involuntarily. <laughs> <I'll> stop. <laughs> Woo, I think that was great. The end of the Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Erica. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, everybody. Okay. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>